Good evening. How is everyone? Great. I would like to welcome you to a special event of our Krasner event series. It's special because we arranged it at relatively short notice, and it uh, wasn't on the original program, but the opportunity arose, so we thought we have to have a session on cyber warfare and cyber security. As you know, I'm Klaus Lyers. I'm the Richard M. Krasner Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs here at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. For those of you who haven't been here before, let me tell you that the Krasner event series has been running since the fall of 2012, and we feature leading diplomats, leading military, leading economists, and leading cyber experts uh, to talk to us about topical events in international affairs. And what could be more topical than a session on war uh, cyber warfare and cyber security? Let me remind you that we have a mailing list. If you haven't been here before, please put your name on our mailing list and you get bombarded with uh, information. Not really, I will um, occasionally only send out information. Then we have a YouTube channel and we uh, videotape all of our events, so please watch our YouTube channel regularly if you can. We have over 1,200 subscribers so far. It would be great if by the end of the evening we have something like 2,000. Then we also have a website that is krasnoevents.com and of course we advertise all our events and other news on that website. I would like to mention that my senior assistant, Maya Kapoor, has taken the lead and the initiative in organizing this event today, and I think she has done a great job indeed. Today we have four leading experts who all deal professionally with cyber warfare and cyber security. There's Dr. Deb Frinke, she is a research director at the National Security Agency and at CSS, the Central uh, Security Service, and she's based in Washington, D.C. There is supervisory agent uh, Jessica Nye. Uh, Jessica is at the FBI Cyber Squad in Raleigh, North Carolina. And there is Dr. Daniel Gonzalka, uh, Gonzalez, I'm sorry, um, and Dr. Gonzalez is a senior scientist at the Rand Corporation in Washington, D.C. And last but not least, we have Dr. Michael Reiter. He is uh, from the Computer Science uh, Department here at UNC. And he is a Lawrence Slipkin Distinguished Professor um, at the uh, Computer Science Department uh, locally. And of course, there's Maya Kapo. And Maya is one of our senior uh, students. She will graduate soon. She is doing, um, she's studying history and computer science. And she's doing a minor in Hindi and Urdu. And so she has her hands full, definitely. The procedure today is that we will have a panel discussion rather than individual speeches at the podium. So I will join the panelists after a little while, after, let's say, another two minutes. And then I will ask every one of them to introduce themselves and their work and the main challenges of their work briefly, perhaps five to eight minutes. Then we will ask questions, particularly Maya will ask lots of challenging uh, questions and interrogate our panelists. And after that, that will take us an hour, or no, sorry, half an hour or 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions from you, the audience. And as always, I expect many lively and engaged questions. This is an instruction. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the rise of cyber warfare, the new frontier of national defense, that is the topic of our evening today. Please join me in welcoming our four panelists tonight. <laughs> What, is, um, your, your, what are the main challenges of your work today and anything else you would like to tell us? Dr. Gonzalez. Um, uh, I came to cybersecurity late in my career. Um, I originally trained as a physicist, a theoretical physicist, and I was working quite a bit on communication systems and a little bit on computers, and um, mainly for the military but also for some other applications. And um, cybersecurity started becoming an important issue. So um, it's something that I've been working on um, for many years now. Um, just one brief example of one thing I'm working on now with some of my colleagues back at RAND is we have um, an internal research and development project to develop um, a capability to better protect 
um, defense contractors from cyber intrusions and the theft of their trade secrets and intellectual property, which is a, a very serious problem that we now have um, in, in this country. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to my uh, esteemed colleagues. <laughs> Dr. Frinke. Okay, so um, boy, if I want to tell you where I started in cybersecurity, I have to go back to graduate school, and I know some of you were not born in 88. <laughs> Don't tell me which ones, it hurts my feelings. Uh, but uh, when I was in graduate school, um, I had made a pivot from veterinary to simulation science, and then the Morris worm hit, and 10% of the internet was taken out, including my homework. This was a problem, and that actually literally did spark some interest. We had some top-notch researchers there, so I went from there, academic career, startup company, a chief scientist, Pacific Northwest National Lab, and now my current job at the agency is research director, but I've also spent some time at my diversity assignment there was leading education and training. So I've looked at cyber from many different dimensions. It's been primarily from cyber defense, but I've also had a chance lately to look at in terms of our support for the command, both the education and training part, and then of course NSA has an expeditionary mission in terms of supporting the troops, and so we have uh, our, our mission there as well, and our defensive mission continues. So about the only mission I haven't worked is the law enforcement side. Uh, and in terms of what is the hardest problem, the short answer to that is the people issue. And um, to put a little context around it, it's because cyber is this new domain and we can talk about it as a warfare domain, but the fact is that cybersecurity is what underpins how we do our work. It underpins the playgrounds where our children play. That's, the, that's what we do at home. We have our education and training. I've talked to a number of people doing online courses. That involves the cyber, as some might say. We have infrastructure that depends on cyber. And so you can't say that there's a military domain and a personal domain, it is all mixed. And now we have the social media dimension as well. So it really is the human aspect and the intertwining of cyber with everything we do in our lives from personal to professional onto the war between nations that makes it so complex. Thank you very much. Jessica Ryka. Hi, uh, my name is Mike Ryder. I'm a professor here in the Department of Computer Science. I've been working uh, like Deb, it, it, since uh, in computer security since uh, graduate school, which I began in 1989, just after the Morris Worm. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I guess I shouldn't admit this on video here, but I thought at the time, wow, that was pretty cool, right? That's really intriguing that you can do that. Uh, and that's honestly one of the things that, that at first uh, got me interested in computer security. Um, in general, or more generally, I think I got interested in it because it's really the only domain of computer science where you get to uh, work against a human adversary. That makes it incredibly interesting because the adversaries are highly motivated and highly intelligent, uh, obviously, and, and so it's really a, quite a, a difficult landscape within which one works. Uh, when I graduated from, from graduate school, I joined at t Bell Labs, uh, where we were founding a new computer security department. Uh, some of you who, who have followed that company know that in the mid 90s it broke up into three companies, created two different research labs. I ended up directing the secure systems research effort for Lucent Technologies before I went to academia in 2001, where I started teaching, and then I moved here in 2007. Um, and since that, you know, back since graduate school, I've been working in various topics of computer security. Most lately, uh, I guess uh, I've been focused in network security and cloud security. Uh, that is studying the uh, security ramifications of moving to shared facilities like compute clouds. Thank you. Before uh, turning it over to Maya, as you're the professor here, how would you define cyber warfare? <laughs> you know when you see it, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, classically, uh, computer security kind of gets categorized into confidentiality concerns, availability concerns, and integrity concerns. Uh, you know, I think if you opened up a textbook, that might be the first thing you see. Uh, in truth, the definition changes over time because the threats come and go. Uh, you know, for example, one example I, used to, I like to use in class is take spam, spam email. You know, it wasn't the case that getting an email was a computer security issue or really a, a you know, a problem, but then when spam became a problem and phishing became a problem, all of a sudden it's a computer security problem. So the definition changes over time and what we focus on changes over time. All right, thank you very much. Maria. Okay, well, thank you everyone on the panel for coming and talking with us today. 
before we get started, I'd like to just kind of define a few things. So could you guys talk about what constitutes a cyber attack and maybe give us some examples of some popular cyber attacks that have been happening recently? So I'll, I'll take a, another step back even further from there, and I'm going to do that because uh, for me it's the full arc of those things that are engaged in a cyber conflict that I'm caring about. You know, our mission includes uh, foreign intelligence, it includes the defense aspect and support for troops. If you think about classical conflict, there's the, the part that's exciting in the movies where things blow up and there's a physicality. You can have a cyber component to that, so there are cyber effects that can result in in physical and cyber cyber war there, but there's also the laying of the groundwork for a war. So there are ways that a nation will gain advantage over another, and that can be the classic diplomacy, which might mean gaining information about a side. There might be classic um, information about um, social divisiveness, and which we're seeing playing out now, so leveraging cyber in that sense. That's not a classical cyber attack, by the way. A cyber attack that is a generative image of me saying something that's not true that triggers a conflict. Nobody's stolen my information, nobody's used my computer, nobody's done anything to me, but yet that would be clearly, in some cases, part of a war. So I think that we have to, in this, at least for me, I'm going to keep it broad, there are formal definitions of declaration of war and what's included, but I don't think that's what's wanted here. It's that all of the pieces, the gaining of the ground, so uh, malware, maybe a criminal gains ground by inserting lots of um, things into a supply chain or a nation state might. That's part of a cyber war. But if it's a thing that turns your light off in, an un in a place that's annoying to you, that's, that's more like a neighbor to neighbor annoyance. If it is turning on and off a power station that keeps you from dealing with your weaponry or stops your <coughs> communication, that's more of a full-fledged attack that we think of in warfare. So it's gotten very complicated and I don't think we've seen anything yet that's a full-fledged cyberware using all of those elements at once. But that, that's where um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay from. Thank you. Um, I, I think that cyber war is much different than regular warfare. And it's one of the things we have been thinking about and working on at RAND is um, RAND, if, if, if the think tank, um, worked on uh, nuclear war and deterrence um, concepts and treaty concepts for nuclear war way back when. Um, some of my colleagues, not myself in particular, but have, have been working on what is cyber warfare and how can it differ, uh, how does it differ from um, classical um, warfare where you have an effort to take over territory to defeat an army or defeat a navy, things of that nature. One of the interesting things today, as uh, literally just a week ago, um, the president just reaffirmed um, a state of emergency. Does anyone know that state of emergency that was reaffirmed about a week ago? And no, it wasn't the border. <laughs> it was uh, a cyber-related state of emergency. We've been in this country since 2015. Under the previous administration, there was a declaration of emergency that allows the president to use certain um, uh, legal authorities to counter the effects of a cyber attack. Um, these are called the, and I apologize, I don't remember the, the acronym, but the AIPA um, authorities that Congress granted the president um, about a decade ago. And so the president can now um, unilaterally um, seize property of foreign national or corporation that is thought to be involved in cyber warfare or cyber attacks. I think the term that's used in, in um, the executive order is cyber attacks, not warfare, uh, against um, parties in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So I think that ex um, reaffirmation of that state of emergency gives us an idea that Unfortunately, we, right now today, um, we are, uh, have some of the aspects of cyber warfare that we're dealing with. Maybe not you at home every day, but um, we, we see that, unfortunately, going on um, with the theft of intellectual property um, and the implantation of, according to, you know, if you read um, the Wall Street Journal, implantation of malware, into our critical infrastructure, in particular our power grid. Um, some have pointed the finger 
at Russia as, as um, the party that uh, has been doing that. And I think, you know, going back to what Deb was saying, it's laying the foundation for something, or maybe they think it's a deterrent activity. That, oh no, we would not dare to, you know, um, uh, um, confront, um, let's say, Russia in Europe, because they could turn out the lights here in North Carolina or in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> so... It's a, it's a gray area. Um, cyber warfare is different. Another um, unique aspect of cyber warfare or cyber attacks is attribution. It can be very difficult to figure out who's really behind something. Uh, and I know the FBI has to worry a lot about that, proving beyond a reasonable doubt that, in fact, so-and-so or some nation state was in fact the, the party that perpetrated a cyber attack against, let's say, Sony Pictures or Maersk shipping lines. So um, those are those are that's a very difficult um, thing to uh, do because um, the cyber attacker can clean up after themselves, remove their malware, move, remove traces of their activities in the network or on computer systems. Um, so. Um, I think, unfortunately, we are, in a sense, um, experiencing cyber warfare today. Thank you. So I'm going to stick with the theme of uh, you know it when you see it and uh, sort of call out a couple of examples from the last decade or so that uh, were, were, to me at least, two of the most jaw-dropping examples of cyber warfare, at least as I interpret the term. Uh, one of them uh, was a, uh, a piece of malware called Stuxnet. Uh, some of you may have heard of this. It was a piece of software that was uh, used uh, as a weapon against the Iranian nuclear program uh, in an effort to miscalibrate the centrifuges that were being used to uh, purify uranium within the context of that uh, weapons program. Uh, and it was uh, essentially it was a piece of malware custom designed to uh, specifically co corrupt a controller that would again slightly miscalibrate the centrifuge and cause it to destroy itself when it was used, the centrifuge that is. And uh, this is I think a great example of, uh, or one of the, f the first sort of very prominent examples of a piece of software put together for the purpose of destroying physical property. Uh, and, and, you know, again, was deployed against uh, the Iranian nuclear program in an effort to slow it down, and slow it down it did. Um, so that's one example. Uh, uh, you know, we were, we, the U.S., were involved in creating that. It's a matter of public record. Uh, and again, a very sort of dramatic example of, uh, you know, the use of software as a cyber weapon. The second one I would call out is... Uh, a report that was published, I believe, in 2012 by a company called Mandiant. Mandiant no longer exists as its own company, it was purchased, but its job as a company, roughly speaking, was to uh, track, uh, be hired by parties that, that um, were being exploited to track and help do forensics to uncover what was happening. And in the context of their work, they uh, tracked a particular actor that they named APT-1 for Advanced Persistent Threat 1 that had compromised or infiltrated a wide number of companies, primarily in English-speaking countries, to exfiltrate data from these companies. Um, in their investigations, right, what, they, uh, what, what they found was evidence to suggest that the perpetrator of this was in fact a unit of the Chinese military. Uh, that was exfiltrating data apparently to convey that proprietary data to competing companies within China. And again, I'm not pointing the finger at China. Lots of countries are engaged in this activity. I'll remind you, Stuxnet was a U.S., uh, at least partially U.S. effort. So, you know, you can argue we started it. Uh, but the point here is that, um, you know, here's, a, here's an example of uh, a very audacious attempt to steal intellectual property uh, for a very different purpose, right? This is, this is a sort of to prop up companies or to feed to competing companies. The Stuxnet example was one, again, where it's used to destroy physical uh, 
actual equipment. Um, and these were two, I think, great examples of different goals for a cyber weapon uh, and, and uh, you know, different means to accomplishing uh, these ends. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Gonzalez, you brought up how difficult it is to figure out who exactly is doing these cyber attacks. So I was wondering if you and the other panelists, so I know I've worked in intrusion detection, could talk about how exactly do we determine who is perpetuating a cyber attack or who wants to start a cyber war? Um, I, I think my colleagues here probably know more than that, uh, more about that than I do, but I'll just <coughs> mention a few things. I think one um, way of doing it <coughs> is to um, is to um, identify the malware and find that the malware is associated or maybe exactly the same malware that was used in a previous attack and so you can attribute it to the same authors. However, that's become more difficult as um, exploits uh, and malware have sort of disseminated um, through the dark web, through the cyber crime world um, and there's been some unfortunate cases where some exploits that came from our, appear to, I should be careful, appear to have come from our national security um, agencies was um, leaked out through various means and were acquired, um, if, I, I believe, um, by Russian hackers. Maybe possibly Kaspersky Labs, um, if you're familiar with that company. Um, uh, and they've admitted that they, Kaspersky Labs has admitted that they were able to um, identify top secret information on a private U.S. citizen's computer and they say they didn't alert the Russian government to that information but I find that hard to believe. But in any case, there's that traceability that sometimes can be used. Um, there's a thing called the command and control network for malware, how is it controlled, and um, this gets into the into areas where um, I actually don't know very much about it, I'm not sure that my esteemed colleagues can share much about that, but they're, they are, they're looking for that all the time, where are the command and control networks for um, Russia, for China, for France, you know, who knows. So there, there are some examples. So you say the French have become our enemies too? <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Um, um, <clears throat> but, but there are everyone that a, a lot of capable nation states are involved in this. I think there are some gentlemen's agreements, hopefully, that are in force. So the French are not doing these things to us, you know, or the Germans. Um, the Americans wouldn't, of course, spy on Angela Merkel's sample, would they? Except to the That's a very unfortunate episode, if it in fact is true. <laughs> <laughs> so difficult for me to comment on sources and methods when we talk about attribution. So as a technologist, why don't I just step back and talk about different kinds of technologies that could be used. So. Just, to, just for quotes, I'm not saying anybody's using these, <laughs> but technologically. So was mentioned authoring, that's certainly a way. Now it's possible to falsify authoring, and, and we all know that malware people, you, it's on the machine, you can capture it, you can reuse it, you can modify it, so it's not 100%, but you can often get some sense. If you can look at where the information is going, that's uh, a good way to examine. Um, as with any kind of a crime, if you can watch it in the context of being committed, um, that is an interesting way to find out who's done what. Um, quite often people will brag about what they've done and then it's a matter of verifying whether they had the capacity. So um, cyber warfare is really just one of the tools. It's a little bit like figuring out who shot the gun or the weapon. Um, you need to trace it back as much as you can looking at the infrastructure that you're able to see. Going much further than that gets into a little bit of, of how one deals with um, optics, and we probably don't want me to share that, but just think through if you're at the more you're able to see, the more you're able to trace the start of the launch of something to the destination of the cyber bullet, so to speak. 
So attribution is hard. What's often harder is that the way that you discover it is not necessarily something that you want or can share with the general population. And so in some sense, it's less satisfying than an ability to watch. I'm not sure satisfying is the right word. But when you can watch a munition being used, you see it come from a point A to a point B. In cyberspace, it does come down to often we see things you can't see, and this is what we believe. And so you'll sometimes see the intelligence community, the cyber command, and other leadership make that sort of a comment in them, often using that additional information that comes from classified sources and methods. Would you, if I may uh, bring that in, would you uh, differentiate between the motives, whether it's economic, strategic, or whatever? I actually think we have to look at the leveraging cyberspace from all of those areas. So for instance, in another area not related to the cyber warfare, I'm on a committee uh, out of Office of Science and Technology Policy looking at the economic and national security implications of quantum. Everything's, when you look at the contest among nations, economic is important. It's not about taking territory necessarily or information. It's gaining objectives and different nations have different goals. So when I think about um, international conflict, I do include economics when it's something important or related to national security, which often it is, or social media activity would be something that I would think about, not necessarily have a program next to, but I would think about. Because my job, of course, is to think through what are those technologies that NSA needs to do its job <coughs> over the next decade or so in, in the contest of nations, and I think all of those pieces play a role. So the panelists on my right do attribution as part of their day job. I don't, and so it's hard for me to add uh, much to their response with any authority. I guess I did want to elaborate a bit on something that uh, Deb alluded to regarding the, the utility of observing uh, attacks unfolding as they're unfolding as opposed to sort of swooping in after the fact and trying to figure out what happened. Um, there's a class of technologies, uh, if you've ever heard of things like honey pots, honey nets, these are all deceptive technologies that are put there for the sake of inviting and observing attackers uh, to them. Uh, they're, they're in use by lots of companies, uh, there's lots of different versions of these things in addition to honey nets and honey pots, there's honey documents, there's all kinds of, again, just deceptive artifacts for the purposes of inviting somebody to uh, rifle through them, try to poke at them, and in doing so you get to watch what the attackers are trying to learn, uh, what they're in, potentially what they're interested in, and hopefully be able to attribute uh, then who's doing it. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to sort of mention that as a class of technology that uh, is, can be potentially useful for this. Mm -hmm. If I could add one piece, it's, I'd like to add a bit about the professionalization. So I know when I started here, we mostly thought, and it mostly was, a couple smart people in a room, and they were at the keyboard, and they were watching, and they tap, 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 and something would happen, there was a, there'd be dragon's paper, and you'd set out a lure, and someone would tap a file, and you'd watch, and it was, it was very dramatic, it was just a few people, it was, it was really like that, and the grad students would do it to each other, so that was, that was kind of, um, cut, we cut our teeth on that. But nowadays, one of the pictures that I've been authorized to share in some other talks shows a, a really different perspective on cyber defense, so just one piece of it. So rather than envisioning that room kind of dark and grad students eating pizza and, and hacking back, um, envision a large area, a, a huge screen that shows pictures of, of the United States with things writ, writ large, um, red and green and yellow, showing activity, cyber attack activity that's been detected around the globe and picture partners sitting there talking to one another. So if there's something that should be related to the FBI, someone who's cognizant, other areas working together 24-7, taking things in, looking at the, the attack, the malware, pulling apart with reverse engineering tools to examine. So it's a professionalized field now. It's not so much um, what felt like a cottage industry in the past. It's a matter of scale because when we talk about whether it's cyber conflict, I'm not talking cyber warfare now so much as just the usual attacks on our infrastructure. It's very large scale and it takes these large teams working literally 24-7 with lots of communication, collaboration around the world. In the U.S. it's especially 
interesting because we have divided up the authorities for different aspects very finely. So my colleague here, she's empowered to look at things regarding U.S. citizens and U.S. infrastructure that are not open without a court order, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for us. Overseas, we have different authorities related to SIG in terms of what we can see. There's um, NRO and what we can do, and GA. There's lots of different ways that you can engage in looking at the cyber conflict. So it takes this teaming effort, and then you take it a step further, critical infrastructures, as you mentioned earlier, it's industry and so on, so you'll need to have a call out as well. So envision when you think about cyber conflict and governmental in large scale, this professional atmosphere. I don't know if any of you were thinking about that olden, movie, olden days and movies, but I know that many people I've spoken to still have that picture in their head of three or four tapping at a keyboard, and while you might see that in general, it's a much bigger team sport, handoff, well-defined roles. Thank you very much. I mean, in the in the real world, uh, I mean, in the non-cyber real world, you have something like NATO, a uh, military alliance, and usually these countries who are members of NATO don't fight each other. In the cyber world, it seems to be there's cooperation, as Jessica outlined, but there is also, as uh, Daniel here said, you know, when we have to think even of the French as potential enemies or foes or whatever you want to say. So what sort of world is that? We have alliances and cooperation, but we also have a lot of distrust among close allies. Uh, how, what is the situation like? Do we cooperate a lot with the transatlantic allies, or is there still a lot of suspicion even among these relatively close allies in other spheres of the world? So I see a great deal of cooperation. What complicates it is that we tend to say when we talk uh, about cyber conflict, and I even did this in, in my opening, I'm looking at the gamut, you can have criminals located in different countries that use a country as a launching point, you can have non-government organizations, you can have terrorists operating in and out of other countries, and they may use governmental infrastructures or corporate infrastructures in order to attack. So you could say it looks like lack of cooperation, but they're actually different groups. And so it's difficult to blame the government of a, of a nation for lack of trust between the U.S. when what you're really saying is none of us are able to ensure that the various cyber infrastructures there are pure, are wholly protected without clamping down on them in ways that we don't want to. And so you'll see that leveraging of cyber crime being different from an economic advantage which might be corporation to corporation, or it might be non-government organizations that are temporarily leveraging, or it might be actual national conflict for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. And that makes it really hard. So beyond the attribution, uh, question, it's the understanding of the rationale and in which context are the nations engaging and the individuals engaging and the infrastructures engaging because all of those could change like that in cyber and it's very difficult to tell in the moment what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think you bring up some important um, points that um, the, the U.S. Um, um, intelligence community has a lot of capabilities and um, <coughs> those capabilities were used in various ways and um, uh, there was the Snowden affair um, who um, revealed um, some of those programs and operations probably should not have been revealed. Um, he, he did um, reveal one program that I know um, a lot of um, people in Congress and um, U.S. citizens have been concerned about, which is um, the, the telecommunications, the uh, bulk meta metadata collection program. I think there's course corrections going on in, in you know, in our country. Um, and and I, my understanding now is that the, the metadata collection program has been stopped. It's no longer being used. Um, <coughs> and Merkel's phone, I mean, that's just, you know, uh, that's just, a, it shouldn't have been done. And that's just my personal view. Is it is still being done? <laughs> <laughs> just out of interest. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think that the technology sometimes precedes the policy and sometimes precedes the legal framework. And so we do, as U.S. citizens, have Fourth Amendment rights. And so, um, the NSA can't just go rummaging around in our email, you know. Um, uh, and 
and so there has to be search warrants and all of that. Um, I think that we're, you know, there are cases still going forward in the courts about what is legal in terms of collecting um, cell phone signals uh, from people. Uh, private sector companies are selling, I forget the name of the boxes, um, that can um, collect on uh, phone numbers and cell phones. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, our system isn't perfect, but I think we're moving in a direction, well, where we can preserve uh, the rights of citizens, but still collect the information we need um, to preserve our national security. It's a, it's a difficult um, thing to do. Um, and the technology by itself is, is, is not um, political. It's not, um, you can use it in so many different ways. So uh, I'm hopeful that, you know, there might be some precedents set soon in the Congress on some of these issues. <coughs> Thank you. Does anyone else want to come in? Well, I'm going to um, okay. quote you in saying that you said that technology has preceded the framework. Um, I think that's definitely true what we were talking about um, with SSA and I mentioning that the FBI has so many international field offices and cybersecurity by its nature is international, but we don't really have an international cybersecurity alliance or kind of corporate, just some kind of uh, organization to handle this. So do you think that that might be necessary in the future? And if so, what would that look like? How would nations go about building it? Um, you, I think what you're suggesting is uh, some sort of treaty framework for, um, for cybersecurity. And I think what also you're suggesting is um, some people would say there's international law. International law um, gov can govern, you know, trade. It can govern um, human rights, things of that nature. There, there, are, there is no international law that I'm aware of that relates to cybersecurity, and these are really important issues. Um, we see Russian hackers, you know, and uh, um, I think an interesting case. Um, is you know the NotPetya uh, cyber attack, which again I'm I can speak freely because I'm not a <laughs> member of a government organization, um, <clears throat> but there's substantial evidence that it was perpetrated by Russian hackers, who had stolen and, and stolen some very effective NSA tools. Um, originally, they had intended that attack to just disable computers in the Ukraine. It was initially propagated through a tax software like TurboTax, but the Ukrainian version of TurboTax. But it spread uncontrollably around the world. And uh, it spread to um, Maersk shipping lines, to ports all over the world. It spread to Merck, a pharmaceutical, American pharmaceutical company. Some estimates say that it caused over $10 billion in damage uh, from companies from different countries in Europe, in Asia, and in the United States. So um, what's unfortunate to me is nothing, there's been no recourse, there's no legal framework to deal with that sort of situation. Of course, Russia has denied it. And maybe, maybe it was just some Russian uh, organized crime groups. Maybe it wasn't a nation state activity, although I, I personally believe that Russia was involved in it. Um, but it, it is a, a highly destructive cyber attack that um, uh, there's been no recourse, no legal recourse that has been pursued that I'm aware of. Other than Maersk is trying to get their insurance uh, companies to pay for the damages they suffered. But the, the insurance companies, I, I happen to know this for reasons reason I won't go into here, the insurance companies are saying, no, there's a there is an exemption clause in our insurance contract that says um, if it's a nation state actor, we don't have to pay. <laughs> so to me, that's an, that is not an ideal um, legal framework that we're in today. And, um, but this crosses inherently international lines. Uh, and so there has to be some sort of treaty um, that needs to be worked through. Um, 
And but I, I don't see much happening on that today, unfortunately. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to turn this question a little bit on its head because I think you intended the question to be about uh, the legal framework, in particular the international legal framework for holding people accountable for cyber warfare actions. Um, I think it's worth underlining that there is a similar lack of uh, legal framework or some kind of market framework. Can you put the microphone? Sure. So there's a lack of a similar legal or economic framework for forcing the computer engineering community to build things that actually withstand cyber attacks. Um, you know, in, and uh, so we're really the only engineering discipline which is given the luxury of making you sign an end user license agreement when you use some software that says, you know what, we don't really know if we, what we just made is gonna work for you, we don't know, you know, good luck. Right. You, when you cross a bridge, you don't have to check a EULA box that says, ah, if the bridge falls down, I don't know, right? Um, sorry, you know. Uh, and, and so, you know, you have to no, look no further than the, the fact that, that Equifax has escaped basically without a mark over one of the worst breaches of our data that we didn't ask it to collect in the first place, right? to say, look, there's something fundamentally wrong about how the engineering community, the computer engineering community in particular, is doing things, right? With an emphasis to first to market, not so much of an emphasis on quality and sort of how, you, how you're building things. There's no building codes, there's no real standards for how you do these things. And of course, every time I say this, you know, people in my field look at me like, what's wrong with you? Stop it, right? But I do believe that so at some point, our discipline is gonna have to face this music. And it's a big part of the problem. I'd like to underscore what Mike just said. And we're about to make it worse in so many dimensions. Think about self-driving vehicles. Um, we are now about to get in a vehicle that uh, is going to be run essentially by machine learning, algorithms, cyber attacks on those have been shown in other areas. There are ways to fool. They're well-known uh, machine learning algorithms. So you can make a stop sign look like a yield sign and through the AI and so we have a place now where people can attack cars self-driving that we are all going to be in we have a situation where our social media we do not yet know how to deal with our our passionate desire for freedom of speech and the right to say what we want to say as Americans and do we want to allow negativity, and I will even speak to the anti-vax movement, um, anti-science activities to be posted that do lead to death uh, with others? Do we allow that or not? So we as a society are running up against the time clock that I would claim started way back in 88 with the Morris worm when so much of the internet, 10%, what, 2,000 machines, all went down. And we have to make some decisions what our balances are going to be. So what responsibilities will we make take on ourselves as citizens? Are we going to check the software in our car? Or will we give over to some other entity to make some rules? What are we going to say about our right to receive and issue speech? Or will we ask someone else to solve that for us? Because it's coming. <laughs> it's pretty much here. There's not a lot of time. I don't want to sound alarmist, even though I do. I want just to be aware that decisions are being made and choosing not to decide is a choice to deal with an infrastructure that supports what we do, that we cannot protect, that has bugs in it, and we realize this, and that's the state of, that's the state of affairs. And so the treaties can't be enforced as effectively with that situation as they could if we had a more solid, um, well-protected, and well-defended internet. And that's something we've all been saying for decades, so. Thank you very much. Recently, um, not just Russia and uh, North Korea, maybe Iran have been in the news regarding cyber attacks, but also China, of course. And that's a big deal, whether, or the big issue, whether the Chinese company Huawei should be allowed to sell its 5G technology in the Western world, not just in the United States, but also other European countries. 
or whether the company should be banned. Are we just being paranoid or is it just well justified, that skepticism? Yeah. Yeah. Start. Okay. Uh, I'll start. I, 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 I do can in the meantime think about the yeah. answers. <laughs> um, uh, it, it is useful to go back and look at the history of Huawei. Um, it has been proven in court, U.S. court, that Huawei stole the operating system for Cisco routers. And I forget the exact um, year, but um, uh, Huawei started, you could say, it's a, it's a great story, they started from nothing, but they, um, uh, through either an insider, I'm not sure, I, I don't know the, the full story, but certainly in court, uh, it was shown that the same bugs and the same comments, including comments written in English, were in the Huawei code for the routers that Cisco alleged they, uh, the software they had stolen. So now you think about Huawei, where it is today. How did it get there? Um, and this is actually a topic uh, that I don't think in the open press, in, in, um, there's probably someone in, in Deb's organization who knows the full story, but I don't think we, the American people, know the full story, but we know that um, Nortel Networks, uh, um, one of the leading uh, routing and switching companies, went bankrupt um, and may have suffered a cyber attack um, and had um, intellectual property stolen. Um, there's, through various means, the, the, um, the industry for um, telecommunication, high-end telecommunication routers, 5G, has really, um, there really isn't a U.S. company there today. Other, you could say Cisco is there, but it's Nokia, um, it's Huawei, and um, it's Ericsson, which is Swedish. Um, and Nokia really is a combination now of Siemens, uh, and it's a Finnish company, but with a lot of German uptake. So we have, the U.S. did not defend that industry adequately. That's my own personal view. Um, and we're now paying the price for it, where um, we'll, and I love the Swedes. I mean, I, I really do. Some of my best friends are Swedish, but we have to rely <laughs> on Ericsson routers or on Nokia routers. Um, we can't rely. Uh, there, there are some. Uh, I'm sorry, on base stations, on base, on 5G base stations, not on routers. So we've got Cisco systems still, but we have to think very carefully about the wireless network and what sort of protections we need to prevent um, that. Um, being a tool used, whether it's China or um, maybe you know maybe Germany. I, like I said, I, I don't think the Germans would do that. But um, <clears throat> so we 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 have a complex history with Huawei, and I think there's a lot of concern, valid concerns based on that history, and probably even more that can't be revealed here today about that company. They could do a software update to their base stations and their routers uh, overnight to start collecting IP packets of a certain, you know, IP addresses. And then send another software update to erase that and collect what they need. So the intelligence capability that they will have with Huawei is enormous. And we have to be concerned about that. What do we do about that? Um, well, I think what we're doing is we're not allowing Huawei um, equipment in the American network, although I think there is some in the American network. I think the real problem is in Europe, uh, where Huawei has said, if you've been following that, this is just, you know, uh, Reuters, um, uh, Huawei has apparently said to some European countries, oh, if you choose another 5G vendor, they will not be interoperable with our 4G network, the equipment you already have. The only way you can interoperate between 5G and 4-way, 4G is with Huawei equipment. So they're, you know, um, and that's a typical business approach. I'm not saying that, but the, it's a very difficult situation that some of the European um, um, wireless carriers and governments are in. We, we somehow have to help them with that. 
Um, and I'm not sure, I, I don't have a great idea for that, but maybe some of my colleagues do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, tricky grounds to comment on. I'll, I'll go where I can, so appreciate the economic comments. It shows the complexity, right? Because we have the economic wish of one company to be superior, stated goals of the Chinese nation to be superior in the technology. Uh, we have, and which is a different thing, a national goal, and U.S. lack of investment in a critical infrastructure that we're going to be, we want to depend on for much of what we are going to do with the internet, um, and the last mile issue of 4G to 5G. So in terms of the danger, the one area I can point to, uh, I would reference the GCHQ report. Um, GCHQ has adopted a mitigation. Uh, the mitigation is that they had used for less sensitive networks of 5G technologies from Huawei, and it stood up in combination, uh, in, in, you know, in tandem with Huawei with full support, an assessment analysis with full access to the source code of the, of the 5G. So the <coughs> idea is they would have the maximum insight into what's running, specs and the like. That's not enough for them to consider it sufficient to use for their sensitive networks. And they've issued a rather scathing report you might want to take a look at showing discrepancies between what they think the code should be doing based on seeing it and what it is in fact doing, which could come down to patches, etc. could come down to sloppy coding. I thought it was really interesting that the Cisco support number showed up in the software at one point. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's just a very difficult situation, but when people talk about mitigations, if having access to the engineers and the source code is not enough to give people that are very able to understand what code does, then uh, it does not give me peace to think we'd be using it. Do you think we should? I would not use it for a U.S. sensitive system, but I'm also very suspicious about all infrastructures. A general caveat with infrastructure beyond whether it's Chinese, Huawei, or the like, is if it's not developed by someone with your very best interests at heart, it is easy for economic reasons, if you just want to make a lot of sales, or for worker reasons to cut off access, or to get complacent because you have no counter, you have no one else who's issuing a similar product. So it's a difficult situation, not having competition is a problem. But um, again, I would say, look, if the GCHQ of the bits have not been successful with these multiple years of investment, then it doesn't seem like there's anybody else likely to be successful. So I'll just add one thing. Obviously, the history of Huawei and its domination in the, uh, its dominance in the 5G market is something that's of concern, and rightfully so. That said, I think the focus on this 5G thing is a little bit of the force for the trees in the sense that the technology that we use across the board, my cell phone, self-driving cars, sure, all of our networks are constructed. I mean, it's a global supply chain. It's a, a you know, the manufacturing processes for these things uh, span, you know, it's not all just made here in the USA, right? So. Um, Sure, it's absolutely warranted, right? The concern about you know, understanding who built the infrastructure on which you rely, um, who built all the devices, the Amazon Alexas and so forth that are running in your home is all relevant in terms of your privacy uh, and your security. Uh, and so while the 5G issue is a very real issue, it is just one example of a larger challenge that we face uh, in terms of under, understanding and trusting the, the technology that we adopt on a day-to-day -day basis, right, across the board for what we do and how we live our lives. Thank you. Maya, do you have a final question before we open it up? Or? Um, yeah, we're going to go for a final question. I definitely do. So, um, I think about a month ago, we had Colonel Wilkerson here, and he talked about the defense budget a lot. And one of the things he said was that he thinks that the defense budget is too much allotted to old technologies, things like aircraft carrier and such. He thinks that it should be allotted more to the uh, cyber field of warfare. So, if you were in charge of the uh, defense budget, where would you allot that money, and like, how would that look for you? Maybe the budget should be lower anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll start. I think it should all go to university research. <laughs> so I'm giving you so many depressing things. <laughs> I'll say something positive. 
budget is really complex, so uh, I, I do my best to balance my own internal budget and we do invest a fair amount in cyber. But um, I'm really heartened. Department of Defense has got two top-notch people in charge of the strategic investment area, um, Dr. Michael Griffin and Dr. Lisa Porter. And they've identified leads for, I think it's five different critical areas um, of Department of Defense advanced technology. So you've got your weapons area, you've got your cyber, you've got AI, you have quantum, you have, I forget what the fifth one is, I think it's bio. And so they're setting a strategic agenda, looking at the big picture of where things need to go. That's important because when we make a pivot in research and technology, it takes a while to get a consistent budget in those areas. So you need a strategic plan for something as large as Department of Defense. But I really like what I'm seeing in terms of the approach coming out, which is not hindering the investments in places like DARPA, which has done some fantastic work in automated defenses, top-notch people in charge there too, are I in the intelligence community, and, and I like to think we do a pretty good job in NSA allocating our technology. So there are people looking at innovation and technology, and they are doing it holistically. It just does take a while to, to turn the ship, literally, and uh, to get the budget where it needs to go, but people are looking at that balance point, and uh, I'm, I'm really happy, especially with the quality of who I see in the Department of Defense. Thank you. When they just heard you, they will say, this, this woman deserves more money. Well, they actually don't control my budget, so this was a completely oh, free commercial. Okay. Mine comes a little different path, so that's just pure admiration. Um, the budget is very complex, and I don't pretend to be an expert on the defense budget. <laughs> I, I think um, it, it's a very difficult thing to balance the traditional needs and um, perception about what is needed to defend the nation and what is needed in the future. And um, so I don't have any special insight on that. But I, I, I do want to point out one thing. The, the Navy actually wants to retire early one of its aircraft carriers and, um, and uh, devote that funding towards new technologies. And I believe there's some resistance in Congress to doing that because each carrier has a home port um, or except for I think one or two and so there there's jobs associated with that so it's, it's there's a political aspect to it as well but your overall premise I entirely agree with that we are not spending enough on cyber defense and on cyber security and the private sector is not capable um, because of their um, their profit requirements, you know, they're just, their um, companies are paying for cybersecurity software and, you know, um, you can go out and buy Palo Alto network firewalls and all of this stuff and, and some of it's good, but it's not enough. And we need a program, and that's something we're I'm working on at Rand, we need a program that can better defend our, our corporations. And so I don't have the answer here today what that is, but I think it's going to cost some money, some funding, some significant funding to do that. Is there actually a ranking of enemy countries in cyberspace? China. Like is Iran or North Korea or whoever is particularly, you know, particularly suspected of being active? Or is it Russia or whoever? There, there are things you can read in the newspaper about that. <laughs> Um, so, for example, um, Iran. You know, I, I, this is this is in I think either the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. Uh, you know, five or six years ago was considered to be like a third-rate um, cyber power, but they've um, become much more sophisticated and capable. And I forget which attack, and I know my colleagues probably can't comment on this. Which attack that they. They, has been attributed to them, but they um, they have gone through some of our defenses. So um, my own personal ranking, just based on news stories, not on any special information, is that you have <coughs> Russia and China very up there, probably with us, and then you have a number of other countries that are not quite as good. Um, but China is in my mind, very 
we're we're not paying enough attention. That's why mm -hmm. we need a cyber defense program, uh, a much more serious one than some of the things that are that the, the military services are doing today. And I, I know that NSA has a program as well, um, and it's an important part of things as well. <coughs> I think that part should be expanded. Thank you. As we are among ourselves, we would like to comment. <laughs> so does say come something complimentary about an adversary relation, and that heartens them, so I don't do it. <laughs> um, but, you know, really, realistically, again, backing up, when you're thinking about adversaries or cyber warfare, you have to think about who is most likely to be able to challenge you for whatever it is that you want to accomplish. So if you think about who is most likely to challenge you for territory, physical territory, that's a different answer than who is most likely to challenge you intellectual property is a different than who's most likely to challenge you in any other regard. And so that is going to change. The capacities are improving amongst all of the cyber actors. So from that perspective, uh, you know, it, it does change from time to time in terms of who's best for each of those areas. But I do prefer not to give compliments to anyone who is the enemy of this nation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's open it up. Let's open it up. Let's open it up. Do we have a microphone? I can, speak. I can probably speak pretty loudly. Um, um, usually a microphone. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like you to put crystal ball and talk about five to ten years. Are we going to be worse off? as citizens with cybersecurity and cyber warfare threats in our daily lives because every device we touch is going to have software? Or do you think there's going to be some technology that, call it biometric, call it firewall, call it whatever, that will be better off than we are today? So I'm just saying, where are we going to be as people in this room five to ten years? Are we going to have to worry about our personal data being hacked, our cars being hacked? More or less? Thank you very much. Did, uh, could everyone understand that? Yes, the audio is good enough. Yeah. So the question was briefly perhaps what about our own personal security in 10 years' time? How dangerously exposed will be our own personal security in roughly 10 years' time? Who would like to answer? Uh, yeah, please. Uh, so, I think one thing I would say is that uh, data science, uh, in other words, collection of data by all of us, it's used for lots of different purposes, whether that's genomic data for predicting disease or you know, choose your, your favorite category of data is only going to increase. Um, and so with that comes uh, risks of having this vast amount of data aggregated in a way that can be uh, you know, stolen and made use of in ways that we can do. I don't, I don't want to swallow it. So. <laughs> you have to. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess from that angle, I would say that things will get worse before they get better. And there are some technologies that, uh, that, that point toward ways forward that are more privacy preserving. Uh, so I know that uh, you know, there are various now tools for doing these kinds of data analytics on large data sets that can ensure privacy in certain well-defined ways of underlying data and so forth. But I think as a general trend, uh, the amassing of huge amounts of data about us is going to, again, uh, make things harder before they get easier. Thank you. Anybody else? So I'll take them in two pieces. Um, the, I'll try to give a little bright spot <laughs> and then tackle the second piece. I think that the policies will become somewhat better understood as we get more people trained in this area. So part of the issue we have now is that it's difficult to get people who've got technological and policy experience and warfare experience in the same room because we just aren't that many people along those lines. There's not a lot of, of expertise. And we're growing that. So this campus, things like this are important in that area. And I really do think that what's going on at Chapel Hill and your willingness to put a cyber warfare discussion 
out and even the history professor who I'm told made some of his students come to this today, so kudos for increasing that crossover between the technologists and the policy because they're both important, so that part might get better. Speaking as a technologist, I give you the bad news. Our tax surface is literally going to be larger over the next five years at least, and probably out to 10, because it's going from, you used to have a car that didn't have all of these smart features in it, you're probably gonna have one with some of the smart features in it that are hackable. You probably are more apt to have a smart home, um, both uh, external, external engagements possible the outside world, so everyone from the neighbor kid to the you know, the, the, the backyard. You're probably more apt to use your cell phone to access your bank and, and, and the devices. I hope I don't have one in me at that point, but you never know. When we're, we're all subject to medical ills. <laughs> we're more apt to have a medical device that has a, a Bluetooth chip. And when I think about the lifespan of technologies, um, when I get to 10, I feel more hopeful about the mitigations because there are some things we're seeing now in technology. It takes a while to buy build, to develop, build, test, and disseminate those things. So unless it's right now um, available in stores, <laughs> then it's not going to be easy to get the government or companies to be allocating, or let alone our personal budget for it. So you have to allow a few years of lead time. So I see a, a dive and then I have some hope. But, but I don't have a precise thing to give. That a tax service is where it changes the most. There's a lot more that we're going to be defending, and that means there's going to have to be a lot more defense. To your point, either investment in helping defend, helping people defend themselves, or things that we have to do as private citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank Dr. Brinke, you talked about quantum, just mentioned it twice. Could you give me your opinion? Is quantum future, quantum technology, more of a threat or more of a solution for cybersecurity? I always say both. I'm going to say both again. Right? So if you can use a quantum computer downstream, I'm not all that just about using the sizes we have now of 70-ish qubits, uh, not going to be building anything hugely defensive com computation-wise so we get a lot larger quantum computer than that they could give you. Uh, whatever length of time to the right it takes to get a good size. There is a known threat from a quantum computer, Shar's algorithm, we've known this since the 90s. It breaks all of public key encryption and that's where you get the quantum resistance movement, which is hugely important. So it would be a race, you know, do we get things quantum resistant before there's a quantum computer? Um, that said, there are some really interesting things one can use in defense that you might be able to leverage a quantum computer for. There are analytics possibly with a larger side. Sensors might be really interesting, and then there's different ways of looking at quantum computing. So the jury's out on the quantum. There is one known threat. Both. Thank you. Uh, right at the end there. Uh. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming. Uh, I'm a computer design engineer and a former member of the Chapel Hill Town Council. I bring this up for this reason. I've always believed that mistakes, incompetence, um, and bad decisions cause far more problems than malicious attacks. No, we're talking about now, let's talk about the electric grid in North Carolina. Duke, We've had two major storms in North Carolina in the last 30 years. Hurricane Fran in 1996, the ice storm of December 2002 that brought down our entire electrical distribution system for six days. The Duke, the Duke Energy uh, line techs and uh, other line techs from all over the country rebuilt the entire system. Okay? I went to the North Carolina Utilities Commission for when they were investigating the response to the storms. And I was really impressed with how much poor thought and poor uh, actions Duke Energy <coughs> had. Now, I'm starting to wonder whether Duke Energy not Rand Corporation, 
but does Duke Energy have the competence to protect the electric grid? Can you address that? So rather than speak to a particular organization, I can point to another, another nice thing I can show you. So in in a sense, the way out of the box we find ourselves in is resilience. If you can set up an infrastructure or a cyber box or any other things or your car to be resilient against both adversarial action and accidents, so it's resilient, it rebuilds itself, self-healing, those kinds of phrases, you now have fewer places where bad judgment of people or malicious or carelessness or the rest can take effect. So if we can move from a state of a, a relatively flawed infrastructure to one that's designed to be resilient from the beginning, maybe not perfectly secure, but able to be repaired in some manner, self-repairing, then we can begin to deal with some of those problems too. Because I, I get you on the bad design. Bad interfaces have caused so many troubles, but that doesn't mean that an adversary can't do it on purpose as well. Thank you. Um, this has been a very defensive kind of a chat. And it strikes me that you're not the risk of uh, uh, getting into a fight. I've been too many fights. I know how they can start easy and wind up difficult. You've got to believe that this country and the, the powers that be can draw a line in the sand and let, now I'll just deal with the nation states, that if you cross this line and we see it, this is the consequence, that we have programmed ready, we're ready to go, and before you cross that line, you've got to know it's going to go the other way. Uh, Thank you, Ben, for the famous red lines. Can there be a red line like in maybe traditional warfare, if that possible in cyber warfare? Well, one thing I would say is to go back to the conversation about attribution. You better make sure you, you have the attribution yeah. part right before you counterattack or whatever it is you have in mind. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a very challenging problem, as, as I think you've heard from, from our other panelists here. Um, Usually, when there's an overt military action, it's not hard necessarily to achieve you did it. In this case, it can be a whole different ballgame. Thank you. There is a phrase called persistent engagement that is being used more and more in DC. And that has to do with understanding where the adversary is and being there. The problem with the red line is that in cyberspace it's more like this, and so you're not going to be able to, if you wait till they've crossed it, then a lot can have happened. Your entire computer system might, if that's what's being under attack, could be gone. So the only way to immediately respond is if you're constantly engaged. And that's a different way of thinking about moving forward. So I think that's getting at what you're recommending here, that there be a way to engage in an adversary that cause consequences. But that's one of the remedies that I'm hearing discussed. Um, I think that it's the red lines are much more difficult in cyberspace. Um, we do have tangible assets um, in our strategic forces that our adversaries know we have. We have submarines with ballistic missiles. We have bombers. We have um, a lot of people forget about this, but we have ICBMs in you know um, in the Midwest states, and those are the, those. If there's an attack on our country um, involving nuclear weapons, an adversary will know that they will they will um, be attacked in kind. The problem with cyberspace is that the weapons are murky and they're, you can't like, I can't trudge out here a, a laptop and computer and say, look, I've got this, and it can take down your power grid in your country. Um, so I don't think we're there yet in terms of deterrence theory. Um, and, you know, there are some people who have suggested that we need to have a demonstration of our capability. But a demonstration would be, um, could cause a lot of um, a lot of destruction. Uh, Stuxnet maybe was it was more than a demonstration. It, it was a, 
and it was uh, you could say it was much better than not Pencha. It was it was relatively confined to these factories in Iran. You know, a, an exquisite operation, really. So, um, so we have that to point to, but um, that's probably not what we need in terms of when we when we relate things back to. Um, the classical theory of deterrence with strategic forces. So we're in this gray zone, unfortunately. Thank you. So the Hiroshima of cyber warfare is a bad idea. Yes, uh, yes please. How, how secure is our GPS system? And does the military now have a separate system? I, I know before they had the ability to turn off what the civilians used. But how safe how safe is that now? Because that affects our ballistic missiles, our airplanes, everything. Um, I can discuss that a little bit. Um, GPS is um, the traditional system. It has two codes. It has the CA code, the civilian code, um, and then it has a precision code. Um, and those. Uh, the precision code has more resistance to adversary um, things that they can do. And the latest GPS satellites are going to have a, a still a new code called M code, um, which I can't say very much about, but which will have even more resistance. So they're certainly in, in, in that community, they're working on that issue. Um, an interesting thing you can read about again in the open press, is how much spoofing of GPS Russia is doing um, in Norway, in the Black Sea. Ship captains are complaining about losing their navigation abilities in the Black Sea. Uh, aircraft um, on approach to Norwegian airports were losing GPS in other parts of Norway. Um, so uh, now that Russia is very active in trying to counter GPS. Um, as we move into the era, or currently in the era of fake news, um, can you speak a little bit to how cyber attacks play into hybrid warfare and what we can do to respond to that? The interconnection between cyber attacks and cyber warfare, what is the connection? Like, what, what do you specifically mean by hybrid? Hybrid warfare, so like, um, kind of fake news, diplomacy, like when there's things that are said that aren't true, but how do we, what do we know what to believe in that kind of stuff? So there's a very active area of research, and I do mean research by the community as well as others, in things like generative images, in understanding the impact on societies of, of news to push them one way or the other. We saw the election, so there's a very practical aspect that people are addressing. Um, you heard in my introduction, I actually include that as potential precursor. Not always a precursor, but there's lots of reasons you might want to push a nation one way or another. It can be for economic benefit, it can be uh, for lots of reasons. Um, so. The interesting thing about it is that we're at the leading edge in many ways of the use of those technologies. As sophisticated as it seems to us, this is the very beginning. If you look at how phishing campaigns work, they started out fairly broad brush, you get a request, you, if you send me your bank account, I'll send you $5 million, you know, that kind of a thing, very obvious. And now the kinds of things that are sent into my inbox are, are pretty sophisticated. And we see that with, with other areas, too. So you could think of the current um, social media, the false news, the, um, the Cambridge Analytica activity as the beginnings of how one might shift opinions in a nation from one direction to another. So you have to expect that that is going to become more sophisticated and become a better tool for it to be used by anyone who's able to practice that as a piece. And so it should worry us both from a societal standpoint, the divisiveness it creates, but also as something that from a military standpoint we need to understand its potential precursor to war. Thank you. Okay. So just to uh, amplify that point a little bit, um, so you've, you might be referring to these deep fake uh, materials that can be, for example, videos that can be created that uh, are just fraudulent videos that are very hard to detect as fraudulent. 
it, it seems likely that in the very near future, we're going to be in a position where we literally can't believe our eyes anymore. And we can't believe our ears. And so to your point, you know, what does that do in the social media context to you know, we're all getting our news, what we believe, what's the truth, that kind of thing. It's a, it's a, a, a difficult challenge, for sure. Thank you very much. This gentleman here and White here. Uh, so, from the historical perspective, if you think about the cyber global warfare, there were, let's say, losing the supply chains to China, uh, disclosure of, well, let's say, data collection, uh, what would you say was the biggest setback to the United States, uh, United States in the global warfare? What was the most damaging event or the chain of events uh, that basically put us where we are? Thank you. The harbor of cyber warfare. Is there something already? No. Um. <clears throat> I actually think it was the decision not to design security from the beginning of the internet. I would take you back to the 80s in, in that era when we decided for reasons of convenience and quick getting of innovation out and moving forward that we were li willing to live with an infrastructure that was fundamentally flawed. And it wasn't that the warning, warning signs weren't great. So I know what you're asking. I'm not actually going to answer that question because I'm not sure it's useful. But when I step back and look at the big picture of what has put us where we are today, it was essentially what Mike said when we started. It was that decision that we as a nation, as a globe, are willing to live with a flawed infrastructure that can be subverted. Um, <clears throat> you can point to certain weapon systems that, and I, I won't go into any particulars here because I'm not sure um, if I should, but you can point to oh, sure. uh, <laughs> very specific weapon systems and you say, it's not me saying to myself, it's, People in the Pentagon saying, how did they get that so fast? Um, so um, there's uh, <clears throat> there's a couple of examples um, that are, you know, and going back to the leadership in the Pentagon, I think it was uh, one or two years ago where um, some of the leadership in the Pentagon became very concerned about this and said we've got to do better in protecting our information. And there have been a number of initiatives to try to do better, but they haven't, um, we're struggling with that. So um, we don't want to tell our adversaries how effective they've been. I, I agree. We have to be careful about that. Um, but um, <coughs> they, they have been unfortunately effective through cyberspace. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Um, <clears throat> my question is, we kind of, um, like many people here, I think, I grew up with a particular notion of privacy in the American context. And I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are about what privacy will be in the American context in 10, 20, 30 years from now. Thank you. Um, privacy, I think, you know, uh, if I captured your question correctly, is, you know, how do, how do we see privacy going forward when we have any of it? Um, I think it's a complex problem. The Europeans have been much more aggressive in trying to enforce privacy rules on the, um, the big internet giants. And I don't want to get political here, but you know, there are um, some politicians who are calling for the breakup of some of these big US companies, high tech companies that really have um, collected a huge amount of information on us. Um, the Equifax breach, the, the, credit, uh, the credit industry. Um, so there's Oh, it's really, I, I, I think we have not, um, we don't have a comprehensive privacy law, is my understanding in the United States. We have certain little snippets of things, uh, and I think it will be, it will have to be addressed um, going forward, but at the same time, we surrender all this information 
to Google and to Twitter and to Facebook, and we, we do get benefits from it. So we, you know, I can look at my iPhone and my iPhone will tell me, oh, um, today, because of traffic in DC, you should take this route home. And I do appreciate that. It knows where my home is, it knows where I work, it's computing routes for me. Um, but um, I don't have an answer for that. I think it's a, a very, um, it, it, you know, we, it, you know, these these big companies um, should they have all this information like Facebook? Uh, and they don't seem to be doing great things with it. So um, I think there's 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 going to have to be some course corrections. But I'll be honest with you, I don't have a a, a, a good idea of what should be done. I think it's going to be really interesting in the next several years, and I'll, I'll take a pivot because I don't think it's from the cyber side that you're going to see the adjustments in privacy, either up or down, improved. It's more from the data science, and even more than that, and I'll venture out and say it's from the economic perspective. So when we talk about the next generation of technologies, we talk about exquisitely personalized devices, exquisitely personalized environments. The way that they get that is generally by monitoring, understanding exquisitely personal details about us and our behavior, either as individuals or aggregate. And so there's a trade-off to be had. If you want to take a device and change it yourself, that's the way we've been doing things. The next step is for the device to learn where you go by monitoring for your house to understand that you'd like it to be warm as you walk into a room and have it move. And so the monitoring, the things that I think of as the most intimate privacy details come from how do we want to leverage our data science, our big data, to make our private lives, our personal lives better, uh, to help improve our medicine, or do we want to keep that depersonalized? And you can see this going on technologically with the census this next year, if you've uh, been part of that debate. Instead of releasing the census numbers at the end, the expectation is they're going to use something called differential privacy, which is essentially going to modify some of the data that the census has collected in order to reduce the likelihood of being able to reverse engineer. They say avoid it, and I, I never like to say avoid or eliminate because I'm not a, I'm a, I'm a paranoid psychologist person on this side. I always think it's possible to reverse engineer. So it's really that side. Um, we're doing better if you think about the intelligence side and how we deal with law. We're getting a lot more sophisticated there. But on the business side, the big corporations, we, we don't understand as a society how we want to even begin to manage some of those pieces. Thank you. Do you want to come to it? I'm not sure I have too much to add except to just sort of emphasize that the, the privacy is a very generational concept, right? When family comes in and single homes, and uh, you know, in small towns, the notion of privacy is a very different thing than what we have today. Um, and uh, I expect it, I think you asked in 10 years or 20 years, it's going to be very different again. I, mean, I know that my daughter will post a lot of things voluntarily to social media that I would never dream of posting. And so <laughs> it's just um, the expectations change over time. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Perhaps we have time for one final question. Let's see, yeah, Adam there. <laughs> All right, thanks for the lecture, guys. Um, I think my question is going to tie in sort of the last question. How do you see over, say, the next 10 years, the United States' ability to keep pace with, say, China or Russia in the cyber race? Um, if you look at just what we were talking about, citizens' rights, um, having to answer to our people, we're not going to be able to keep pace, say, with an authoritarian regime which can do whatever, whatever it wants. I mean, if you look back, at say the NSA's, uh, I think it's the Starwood program that we had to shut down because it was invasive on our citizens' rights. I don't see how we would be able to keep pace with a country that can just do whatever it wants, especially in the next five to 10 years. Um, I, I have a different concern um, about keeping pace with them. And it's not so much privacy rights and things like that, it's more, uh, that uh, the people, it's the skills. Um, the government and the government contractors are, have to compete with Amazon and Facebook and Twitter uh, for some of these very skilled people, software developers. 
we, uh, our company ran, we, we have to compete with those folks. And, um, you know, some of, some of the agencies, they, they get people who are really dedicated to the mission. So they're, they're able to, to do some of that. But I, I'm concerned that, um, you know, do we have enough software developers? Do we have enough engineers um, to keep pace both on offense and defense? Um, with uh, these command economy oriented countries where they can say, ah, we're going to create this state of enterprise and we're going to we're, we're going to take all of these graduates that they're going to accept the job over here and start working on this. So uh, that's the concern I have. I agree with that. I think that the technological ability to advance is in some jeopardy. And I'll add to everything that you said one more. So we have benefited a great deal in this nation by welcoming others to our academic and technological institutions. And there have been marvelous things accomplished with both immigrants, permanent residents, and temporary members of our society. If we go too far towards complacency, we head towards intellectual property theft and educating those who leave. If we go far too far on the other side, we strike at the very heart of why we've done so well to this point in our technology. And so we have to think very carefully about what it means to both develop the next generation and how to remain innovative, free, innovative, allowing ourselves to work on the things that are most valuable and complete. So I say we have to get there. I wish I could say we're definitely going to get there. Here's the, here's the map. But those are the things I think we've got to consider is not to let fear rule us and also not to put blinders on. So since you were dead set, I think, which is that, you know, for 40 plus years, the U.S. has been a destination for the world in terms of innovation and bringing students to our shores to study these topics and help us innovate. We have to make sure that we appreciate that, that you know, it, it, what that openness has enabled us to achieve and make it possible for them to stay here. Because uh, when they want to, we want to keep them here. Uh, that's my opinion anyway. And so I think that's a really critical part of us staying ahead. Thank you very much. I don't want to let you go without you telling us what is the most pressing problem you would like to be uh, to see tackled immediately. What keeps you up at night? What is the, the one problem, though there are 10 or 20, but take, pick the, in your view, most urgent problem? And uh, at the same time, I use the opportunity to thank every one of our panelists and uh, Dr. Gonzalez from the Rand Corporation will tackle my question first. Um, I, I think that we we, um, we we need to tackle the problem of um, the theft of trade secrets, intellectual property theft. I think that's our number one issue. We're making some progress, but we have to we have to do much more. Thank you, Dr. Jeff Frinke from the NSA. And I wish for one, but I don't think I can get. If I could have, if I could have one thing, it would be a more solid, resilient base that we could build the rest on. We can address a lot of problems if we have improved resiliency. Thank you. And Maya Kapo from UNC. Sure. Um, so I would say my biggest concern is probably the securing of data with private companies, because as you mentioned, um, you know, we're for some reason okay with getting Facebook and Google all of our information. Um, but that is not as secure as it should be, and especially as the federal government is relying more and more on private contractors. Um, there needs to be a focus on preventing external governments from infiltrating private contractors uh, that have their intellectual property rights and making sure that they can't get to government secrets through a private door. Thank you. And Professor Rector from UNT? Sure. Uh, I guess what keeps me up is uh, why we keep making the same mistakes. You know, I've been in the field since the early 90s, and I feel like from a computer security perspective, we haven't learned that many lessons. And exactly how we're going to move the needle on these is what keeps me up. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very Thank you for coming along. Our last session this uh, semester is on the 24th of April, and it is about the topic, Can we live with China? So, and Susan Ford, the former Assistant Secretary for Pacific Affairs, will enlighten us. Please come back on the 24th of April, and thank you very much again for coming today.